Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. I am very happy to be joined today by Cliff Goldmacher and Laura Davidson here from Shore. Uh, we are going to be talking about what to do with your rough recordings. Uh, as I told you guys previously before we jumped on air, uh, I just don't know what to do with them. So I'm actually really excited to find out what I should be doing with them, not putting them in a, in a storage area and just leaving them or putting them in the trash bin. So really excited to hear it. Uh, do wanna give a special thanks to our sponsors of this event, Sure. Uh, thank you very much for setting this up. We really appreciate that. And I do wanna let everybody know that if you are joining us here, really excited to tell you that at the end of this presentation, so you get extra credit for staying around and listening to the whole presentation, you are entered into win the uh, Shore MV88 kit. So that's something really exciting, something that we're really happy to present to you. So make sure to stay tuned for that towards the end. Uh, keep in mind, if you have any questions, anything like that, if you're joining us on Zoom, go ahead and use the chat, the Q&A, uh, get those in there for the live stream, Facebook, same thing as well. Make sure you ask any questions there and we'll address them as they come. Uh, Cliff, Laura, the floor is yours. Really excited for this. Take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Scott. And hey, Laura. So this workshop is about what you can do with your rough recordings once you've made them. But by way of introduction, uh, I am Cliff Goldmacher. I have been a professional songwriter, a music producer, and audio engineer for about 25 years now. And I am proud to have been associated with Shure for almost that entire time. Um, what I wanted to do is talk about specifically the importance of rough recordings, what you can do with them, and some ways to significantly bring up the quality of those rough recordings. And that's where Laura and Shure come in. So why don't we start with the, the definition of a rough recording? The way that I would describe it is any simple recording that you do directly into your smartphone or your tablet or your laptop, generally it's a single instrument plus a vocal, either a piano or guitar and a vocal. Dead simple, rough recording. We used to call these back in the day, work tapes, but that's not what we do anymore. And, and that's actually a great thing because the quality of the recordings has improved exponentially. So the goal of Rough Recordings really is to capture your new songs. If you're a songwriter, whatever you're recording, but to capture as a songwriter, your brand new songs, melody and lyric. And if you're playing an instrument, which isn't required necessarily, but if you are also the chord changes that are part of that song. Now, um, I am going to address this to anybody who is a musician who wants to record, but specifically for songwriters, because rough recordings are just a critical part of not only the songwriting process, but the editing process and ultimately the presentation process. It, it works across many different phases of the recording. Um, but I thought I would sort of get in early on why sound quality matters in these rough recordings. Ultimately, the more clarity that you have in your recording, the better that it will capture the emotion and the intention of the songwriter. So this translates ultimately, if you're going to bring this rough recording into a recording studio to have a polished recording done, the recording that you make as the songwriter, if it has good sound quality, that emotion and intention will translate to the demo singer and the session musicians in the way that they interpret your song. It doesn't even matter if you as the songwriter are a great singer or player. What, what matters most is that your intention comes through. Um, also, having a good quality recording helps you up your game as a performer. Quite simply, and you'll know this from live, but as well as, as recorded sessions, the better you sound to yourself, the better the performance you will give. End of discussion. There is something about the way that you sound that will inspire you to up your game if you sound good. If you are not just a songwriter, but a singer songwriter, genuinely a performer as well as just a songwriter, then you will significantly improve your odds of capturing a great performance in a quality and a format that you can show and pitch to industry 
executives. It makes a huge difference if you've given a great performance, if you have also managed to capture it in a great sounding way. And then finally, as far as sound quality is concerned, it's my experience that the best and most emotional and connected time to record your song is just after you have finished it. And before you've had too much time to think, and I put in parentheses, overthink your song. Having great mics on hand makes that possible. So let's talk a little bit about how to make a polished rough recording. And I know that sounds a little bit like an oxymoron, but there is such a thing as a polished rough recording because you can just play and sing directly into your smartphone and it'll sound fine, it'll sound fine. But why not up your game? I mean, the, the whole idea here is to up your game so that everything that this recording touches is just that much better. So as far as ways to make a polished rough recording, using a high quality condenser microphone that can be connected to that smartphone or tablet or laptop that I mentioned earlier makes a big difference. And what also makes a big difference, and this is the same thing they say about cameras, right? When they say, what's the best camera? And the answer is the one that you have with you right then. It's the exact same thing with my, what's the best microphone? Well, it's the one that you've got with you at the time. So why not improve the odds of getting something great by taking along something that is great sounding, but also easy to take with you? Um, and sure, in their motive line has absolutely rung the bell with a variety of different options of microphones that are small, but sound unbelievable. Um, and so what I thought I would do is maybe mention the mics and then have Laura tell you a little bit about each one as we go. Um, so the first one that comes to mind for me is the Shure MV88. This sort of got the whole party started, I think, with the motive line. Um, and this is one of those that for clear live in-room instrument and vocal performance, I just think this one's great. So Laura, you want to tell the folks about the MV88? Yeah, so MV88 is the predecessor to this, that the MV80 Plus they're actually going to be giving away. Um, and I thought I had it right here, but I don't. But it's a stereo condenser mic that plugs directly into your iOS devices. So it has a lightning connector on it. So that's really great when you're doing your writing sessions, especially because there's no bear here. You just take it out, plug it into the phone. It's going to work in any of your apps that you're capturing it's, the audio. It's that big. It's, it's that tiny. Big. You can take it anywhere. You can rotate the barrel so you can have, you can be capturing the full stereo image of the room you're in. If you're in a co-write, you can set it on the desk in between you and change the polar pattern of the mic, which I'll show you in the 88 plus in a minute. So you're capturing yourself and your co-writer at the same time. So that's a really cool feature. So I just, I just want to pop in and I want to interject. I told you, Cliff, I have no problem interrupting when I have a question here. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, actually, this, this kind of goes to Laura, but, you know, Cliff, you could definitely jump in too. Uh, in, in, for anybody in the audience who's, who's paying attention to this and wants to know, can you just kind of go over what a condenser microphone is? Yeah. You know, I, I know you can go down a rabbit hole and get crazy, but we, we don't just, you know, it's kind of nice, neat package. Yes, super at the most basic level, when you look at microphones, there's two types that we really know and love the most and see all the time, dynamic and condenser. And a lot of people kind of confuse those terms with the polar pattern, like cardioid, let's say, oh, I have a cardioid mic. Well, cool, is it a dynamic or a condenser? Cause that's just how the microphone picks you up. But a dynamic or a condenser is, is how the mic physically works and takes the acoustic energy and uses a transducer to convert it into an electrical signal. So basically a dynamic microphone has a thin piece of material called a diaphragm. And when you talk or sing or perform into it, it vibrates and it's attached to a metal coil and that vibrates too. And that is surrounding a magnet. And when it does that, and when it vibrates, it creates that electromagnetic field, which creates the signal goes down your cable into your mixer or into your computer. And that's how you hear it amplified. But a condenser microphone is a little bit different because instead of having that magnet and the coil to move, it's using an electrically charged back plate and a much thinner diaphragm. So it's a lot easier to move that diaphragm. It doesn't take as much energy. And the electrically charged back plate gets that charge from something called phantom power, which you may have heard of a lot or seen a plus 48 V on your mixers or your um, interfaces. And so a condenser microphone uses that phantom power 
And it's a lot easier to make that diaphragm respond. So it's a lot more sensitive in a good way. And so having a stereo condenser mic in the palm of your hand like this, this looks like a tiny mic, but it sounds huge because it is able to capture so much detail without having to move that magnet and coil and, and all of those other physical things. So that's kind of the, the short overview to what. Yeah, no, 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 that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in sort of macro terms, and there are exceptions to every rule, but in macro terms, dynamic mics are generally live mics and condenser mics are generally studio mics. Now, somebody's gonna raise their hand and say, but didn't Michael Jackson record Thriller on an SM7B, which is a dynamic mic? Yes. There, there are no hard and fast rules, but if you wanna speak in sort of general terms, dynamic mics are like the handheld mics, like the Shure SM58, which you've seen everywhere. Um, and then a condenser mic is, is typically a mic that is sort of hanging in the studio, tends to look a little bit more studio-ish. Uh, what were the chances that Laura might have a mic like that? Like right here, yeah. <sighs> yeah, doesn't that look like kind of a mic you'd have in a studio? So, yeah, so it is in my studio, it's fancy so, that. So the trick here is to understand that these mics that we're talking about in the motive line work like studio mics, mm -hmm. but in a really small package that you can take with you and, and that give you lots of options. So speaking of options, why don't I let, um, Laura, tell you a little bit about two of the condenser mics that are designed as, as single condensers. They're not stereo mics, but they're terrific. The MV5 and the MV51. So there's the MV5 and there's the MV51. Yes. So these are both condenser microphones. This is a large diaphragm condenser, similar to that KSM32 that I just brought into the, the picture here from a minute ago. <laughs> And so that just means that it's gonna capture a little bit more detail, but still give you the richness of the MV5. So condenser microphone um, differences being the MV5 has just a couple of presets, um, a headphone out on the back and a USB connection. Whereas the MV51 has five different presets. Uh, you can control it either using our Motive app or right on the front of the microphone itself. You can control your headphone volume, your mic gain level, uh, and it has a headphone out on the back as well, which I love about all of our Motive products, except the 88, the 88 plus has one, is that you can monitor in real time and that's really key. So these two specifically are really great for singer songwriters, especially the MV51. That's the one Cliff is using right now to talk to all of us yep. uh, because it captures a little bit more of the nuances and details uh, thanks to that large diaphragm. So if you were to set this on the table in a writing session, it would capture things beautifully as well. It's great for trios, string instruments, you know, things like that. So, and this one, the MV5 is really great for podcasting um, just because it's form factor but it's also great for capturing song ideas as well. And it's so sleek and simple and just, you can actually take it off of this stand and it'll sit right on your desktop without this guy. So even more portable. You have to show the secret weapon of the MV51. The secret that it is a weapon? <laughs> well, it, first of all, it weighs about 50 pounds. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it doesn't, but it's really solidly built. But yes. what I mean is the fact that you can actually mount it to a mic stand. You can. So, so normally it has this cute little rubber foot on it so it can sit on the desk. Uh, that has gone the way of the dodo for me quite a while ago, uh, but you can actually- I can it there. <laughs> there it is. But you can do it like this. You can mount it like the MV7 on a boom arm. You can put it on the desk or you can screw it into a mic stand. So that is the secret weapon there. And, and that to me, that makes it the perfect studio mic. You can travel with it, but if you do find yourself in a, in a working studio session with a mic stand, you set it up like a, a nice studio condenser mic and it works beautifully. Mm -hmm. And I've done that plenty and, and, and love it for that. Uh, and then the last one is the Shure MVI. And, and this is one that I think gives you options above and beyond just using the condenser mic <laughs> that comes built into some of those earlier models. So Laura, what is the MVI? Yeah, so MVI is a single channel interface. So think of this as just a standard audio interface that you would plug a microphone or a guitar into, but it's just one channel. So it's great for podcasting on the go, recording on the go. If you already happen to have something like an SM57 or a 58 or another handheld or 
you know, microphone that you already know and love, this is going to let you plug it in and then get that into your phone or into your computer because this is a USB interface. So same great controls as the MV51. You have those five presets that you can control your headphone level, your mic gain, and then it also has that headphone out on the back. And this will provide phantom power and you can plug your XLR or a high Z in, so a quarter inch cable for instruments. So this is kind of a, a really good tool to have in the toolbox because if you wanted to uh, record your roughs as you were there at the session and then you know go back home and do something more robust in the studio, this is gonna stick with you for all of it. So that's why I really like the MVI for all of that. I've also used it. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a high-end lapel mic that Shure makes. And the thing that I love about that is that I can use that lapel mic and run it straight into my Zoom session, whatever the case may be, using the MVI. Yes. So, and and speaking of which, Shure also makes a, a lapel mic that is part of the Motive uh, group, doesn't it? Yes, it's called the MVL and it's lavalier. That's what the L stands for. And it plugs into the three and a half millimeter jack on your phone. Um, so it can work. It's a TRRS cable. So it works as a communications cable as well as a monitoring cable, essentially. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a very simple way of getting your direct audio, especially if you're doing an interview in the field, clip on that lapel mic and get great sounding audio directly into your device. So that's a lot of information. And maybe, uh, Scott, we should pause and see if at this point anybody has any questions about any of the various uh, sure motive products before we go on to things that you can do with those rough recordings that you will have made. Yeah, we can we can see what you know questions start to populate in. You know, one one thing that I thought uh, was cool about the MVI that you brought up and, and Cliff, you kind of hinted on this as well. Uh, that's very interesting is, you know, now we live in a very virtual age, right? Where we've, we've kind of had this huge shift and everybody's had to shift to virtual events and meetings and things like that. And, and this was something we discussed early on before, you know, we got on the air is, you know, just kind of everybody went from these, these you know, webcams to then maybe, you know, better cameras. And then, you know, they next thing they chose was audio. And I think a lot of people, get intimidated by looking at some of the other microphones, you know, something like a studio microphone or anything like that. But being able to get something that's in a smaller package and then using something like the MVI, which really kind of almost makes it seamless and easy for the, the beginner to then, you know, input that information into your, to your computer and use it on Zoom and things like that. I think that's a great uh, option for people at home who are listening and thinking about that. It's a great way to, you know, kind of without getting a huge mixer with tons of different buttons and levels and things like that, you can kind of just almost plug and play. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and here's a pro tip. On occasion, I will run a workshop online where I am talking, but then to illustrate a point, I will pick up my acoustic and I'll play and sing a snippet of a song. What I do is I have my lavalier mic running through the MVI and that's for my voice. And then I've got the MV51 set to a guitar pattern on my desktop. And here's the, here's the inside baseball tip. There's a little piece of software called Loopback, which allows you to create a, an input that is the blend of those two microphones. And what that allows me to do is select that Loopback input in Zoom or whatever, whatever program I'm using so that not only does it sound good while I'm performing live, but then when you go back and you listen to that recording of the Zoom workshop, you've got something really special because you've actually used two mics, one to sort of highlight your vocals so that it doesn't get drowned out by the guitar, which will be closer to a mic on your desk. So it's, it's a really nice way to kind of blend. Now that's, I'll, I'll admit, that's um, recording 201, right. but still, it's something still to think good. about. It's, it's like a, it, yeah, loopback is like a virtual patch bay. So if you have any sort of bass audio knowledge, you can really do some fun stuff with it. Right. Definitely. Awesome. So Cliff, I'm, 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 I'm getting anxious over here. I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm getting excited. You're, you're, you're like cliffhanging me here. I want to know what do I, what do I do with these rough recordings? Okay. It's funny that you should ask. I think you should just throw them away. Like you said earlier, before we went online, I, I can't think Excellent. of a single good thing to do with them. Excellent. Sure. Thank you so much for yep. being here. And we'll see you later. <laughs> and yeah. No. Okay. No. So lots of things that you can do with your rough recordings. And let, let's start during the songwriting process. This is for you songwriters out there. 
one of the things about the songwriting process that I noticed the more that I did it was that on occasion, as your kind of stream of conscious brainstorming, stream of consciousness brainstorming your ideas, you'll you'll play something or sing something and then move on, not thinking too much about it. And then all of a sudden you'll kind of wake up and realize, wait a minute, what was that thing I did about a minute ago? I think that will really work. I happen to, in my sessions, run a live recording the entire time. And so during the writing process, I'm able to, if I feel like I've got something that, that happened a little earlier, we'll stop the proceedings for a second. This usually happens in a collaboration, in a co-write. And we'll, we'll go back a minute and listen and find that thing because part of the creative process is you're just constantly pushing forward and coming up with ideas. And you're not really, you're not really listening too carefully. It's just all kind of happening. But then there'll be that moment where you think, okay, we've tried a few things. And I think that thing we did about five minutes ago, that's the one. What did we do? And if, you've, if you're making that rough recording along the way, it's a great way to go back, reference that thing, and save something that might otherwise be lost forever. So I am constantly using one of the motive mics in a live session, writing session, just to make sure we're capturing everything as we go. Secondly, the moment the song is done, it allows you to capture that final song. And like I said, I feel like that is the most emotional and the most connected you will ever feel to that song because you're just in it. Now, for some people, if you haven't written a lot of songs, me saying, well, you might forget your song sounds crazy, right? Like if you spend months working on a song, you're not gonna forget it. It's in, it's in you. But if you write a lot of songs, the more songs that you write, one day you're gonna wake up and realize you worked on a song yesterday and you have no idea how it went. It's just gone. So what I love about making a rough recording when you, when you think you're done is, it takes all of that uncertainty off the table. But it does more than that, because one of the things that I have found, and this goes now for live performers as well as, as pure songwriters who don't perform, it is amazing how when you stop and you listen back to the rough recording of your finished song, the little tweaks and revisions that will reveal themselves to you that you never heard while you were performing the song or singing it in the writing room. So you, I'm not kidding, you can have played a song a hundred times live, but you're playing it. You're not listening to it like an audience member would. And the first time you stop, sit down, put your lyric sheet in front of you and just listen like an audience member would, things are gonna reveal themselves that weren't quite working or the, the, the phrasing sounds a little jumbled or maybe too complicated. That stuff shows up when you listen to the rough recording and not when you are performing the song. So I love using rough recordings as a way to act like an audience member to your own song and make those final revisions and tweaks that, that really change the game. I mean, it's, it's sort of levels your song up again because you're, you're able to edit in a way that you're not in real time when you're singing the song, even if you're just singing it in the writing room and you think you're listening while you're singing. I know my brain's not that gifted. So I love having that rough recording to refer back to. Then, if and when the time comes for you to go to a professional studio and do a demo or even a master recording, having that rough recording to provide in advance the session singer so that they can do one of a couple of things. One, they'll learn your melody, but two, they'll be able to decide what key is going to work best for them. And that's something that will happen only when they hear the key that it's currently in and they try to sing along and they think to themselves, oh, that's too high for me or, oh, that's way too low. That only happens if you give them the rough recording. Um, and the session musicians can also learn the song and, and write a chord chart. A lot of songwriters agonize over the fact that, well, I just wrote this song, but I don't know how to, um, I don't know how to write a chord chart. If you have a rough recording, any session musician worth their salt will be able to write a chord chart out for you in no time. What, what seems to the, the average songwriter as a magic trick is, is all in a day's work for a, for a session musician. But giving them that rough recording is hugely helpful. But it's, it's even more than that. Early on in my songwriting career, I thought, this is no big deal. I've written the song. I know the song. I've been performing it for a while now. 
when I get to the studio to do a professional recording of it, I'll just bring my guitar and I'll sing it for them and play it for them. And it didn't take me very long to realize when the session musicians say, okay, what was the second line of the second verse? How does that go? And I would just lock up. I couldn't remember my song. I couldn't remember how it went. Like the moment I'm asked to do something other than sing it from beginning to end, I'm, I'm dead in the water. If you have the rough recording, what you have is a baseline version of the song that you can refer to for anything. If the singer is messing up inadvertently, messing up the melody in, in the second line of your chorus, instead of going, oh, shoot, how does that go again? I know you're not singing it right, but I don't know how it goes. You simply refer to the rough recording, which, by the way, is the easiest thing in the world to import into the recording session. So it's right there. You can just use that as a point of reference. And it I'll tell you what it does. It makes everybody's lives easier and it takes your stress level as the songwriter and lowers it way down because you don't have to perform the song on the spot in random spots and start and stop and do all those things. You've got the version of the song that you made earlier. It sounds great because you've used a great sure motive mic. Use that. So that's a that's a big reason that a rough recording can be hugely helpful. There's more. You can also document your writing process. I'm going to put in the chat pane in Zoom a link to an article because I get this question all the time. I've just written a song. Do I need to copyright this right now so no one will steal it? And I, I totally get it. My first couple songs were my song children. And I, I was terrified that someone would kidnap one of my song children. The reality is that the moment you write a song, it is effectively copywritten. The only time I actually copyright my songs is when they are going to become available for commercial release. If they're streaming on Spotify, if they're used in a film or a TV show, if an artist puts it on their record, okay. That's when you copyright. Before then, as I like to say, and I haven't heard anybody's songs in the audience, so don't take this personally. If you're worried about copywriting your songs, my recommendation would be worry more about writing a song that someone would want to steal and less about copywriting your songs early on. All that to say, having a rough recording, because these things are always time stamped, is just one other way of showing, hey, this is when I did this. This is when it was written. Here's the timestamp on the audio file. It's just another way of proving that the song is yours, should you ever need it, which is rare, very rare. I don't want to scare anybody. And I just want to, I want to, I want to jump in on that. Please. Because, because you mentioned something, and I think this brings up another topic that I, that I'd like to kind of address. So, you know, Referring to time stamping, and, and this may be out of your expertise, but you know, now in a digital era where everything is so digitized and you know we've got Photoshop and things like that, you know, is there ever a concern on your end that somebody can somehow, you know, fudge, we'll use the word fudge, <laughs> uh, or finagle, okay? Well, I'll, I'll let the, the Brooklyn out of me, uh, you know, the, the, the time coding, of that information to then try and reflect that no actually you know I know I know that Cliff presented this as you know evidence but actually I went back to my house and I you know predated it back somehow on my end and you know then presented so that now it looks like I've actually been the one who was who was before you even though I wasn't I don't have a good answer I have a potential solution um and that potential solution has to do with using an online backup service like Dropbox or something like that. The moment you take that audio file and put it in Dropbox, you're now, it's now Dropbox's servers that are timestamping that thing. So the moment it gets uploaded to the cloud, even in your secure system, that's yet another way to sort of take that audio file, which, which to your point, is it conceivable that they might be able to do that? Sure, it is. But if by uploading it to a cloud service, um, that is a, yet another way to sort of timestamp it in, in a way that is significantly more difficult to modify. Awesome, honest, honest answer. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was just as close to making something up, but I stopped myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, a final fun use of the rough recording. 
especially if you then take that rough recording and go into a professional studio, is that it's a fun way to kind of see the before and after. Like, here's what was, was sung in the writing room the day we finished the song, and here is the version that ended up charting on the Billboard country charts. And I, I actually have one of those from a client, and it's really fun to have it for that. But I will tell you something else. There are times where that simple, beautifully recorded rough recording will have more emotion and more power than the version that they go into the studio and spend 10 grand on. There's just something about a great scaled down just after it's been written rough recording that sometimes is more powerful. Um, uh, and if, if you want, I might even be able to find those examples and play them for you. Um, if Laura, you'll buy me a little time, I might be able to find an example of that. Uh, yes, I think I can buy you some time. It's actually a good segue because I was just asking Shira to post some of the links into the chat for everybody, for all those products that we were talking about. Um, at Shore, we always like to, to lead with the educational element. So we hope that you never feel like we're trying to sell something to you. But it does tie in nicely to what Cliff has been talking about is that we make these microphones that can make your rough recordings sound pretty great. Um, and a few of them are on sale on bnh.com right now. So um, you can see the like the MV51, for example, and the MVI have some instant rebates in place or instant deals. So now's a good time to get them. Um, and the MV7, which I didn't even get to talk about, that's this, this shiny silver one that I'm talking into, which is great if you're going to be recording at home, if you do podcasting or um, live streaming, or just for recording music. I have the lawnmower going outside the house right now that decided to start up right now, and, and hopefully you're not hearing it, but it's really, really loud right outside my window. And the benefit of using a dynamic microphone like the MV7 is that it actually rejects sounds coming from the rear and sides of the mic and lets you have less than perfect acoustic environments like my office sound pretty darn great and professional. So I'll throw a link in there for that as well. And I have found my recordings. And in the interest of full disclosure, what you will hear is effectively a guitar and vocal. It was done in a studio, but there's a guitar and a vocal. And what I, what I really want to what I illustrate here is a properly recorded guitar and vocal sometimes can beat a whole band. So why don't I do this? I'm going to turn on my original sound and I'm going to attempt to share my screen. It looks like I can do it, which is great. And I'm simply going to share the sound. So. I'll start with the rough, rough recording in the writing room. I'll just play everybody a snippet of this. And I'll, Laura, give me a thumbs up if it comes through okay. Here it comes. Okay, so that is truly, that is the rough recording from the writing room five minutes after the song was written. Now here is a very simple guitar vocal, also before the, the full album cut. So here's the guitar vocal. I get your picture out on a rainy day Just one more thing I should throw but the hands of time, they move so slow. I never let you go. Dead simple. Voice, guitar. Now that is the songwriter. And the songwriter is, is very clearly also a gifted artist. But now listen to the full band recording and tell me which one you like more. And I'll just play you a little snippet of this. And this is the artist now recording the song, who is Again, by admission, a little less experienced than the songwriter who wrote it. Watched you walk away, 
I heard you say goodbye Couldn't make you stay Even if I tried Even though You're not here to hold I never let you go I get your picture out Okay, so so let's talk about that for a second. Slightly, slightly less talented. But what it shows you, I think, most of all, is that it 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 shows that a simple guitar and vocal with good microphones and a good performance is a powerful thing, and it can beat drums, bass, pedal steel, background singers. In other words those rough recordings count and they count for a lot um okay before we talk about why songwriters specifically should care about audio even if they're strictly songwriters why don't i pause for a second and see if anybody else has any questions yeah i think i think uh this this is a good uh, opportunity to answer this question you know from a from a songwriter perspective what what input do you get when when you're dealing with an artist who then takes that song? You know what what leeway do you have there? Do you do you get any input, or are you just kind of like, here's the song, here's what I envisioned, and then okay, now it's like, get out of here, see you later, Cliff. Thanks very much for joining us. Or or <laughs> or can you can you share with them and you know kind of go through that process of you know emoting with them? I, I will answer that question with a question and an answer. The question is, what happens if you write a song and you love the way that you have done it? And then an artist decides to record it for their album for a major label, and they do it in a way that you genuinely don't like. Because it's art, and that's how these things go sometimes. What is the thing that you say in that instance? There's only one right answer here, by the way. Did you, did you pay me enough money? <laughs> the, the, answer, the answer is thank you very much. End of discussion. If you are writing a song in the hope that someone else will record that song and they are then willing to put their reputation and their artist career on the line by representing themselves with your song, however they choose to do it, get over it if you don't like it. Get over it. And, and I, I had this happen to me. I wrote a song with an artist we wrote it as kind of a slinky, sort of jazzy, almost came out like a um, fever, like that kind of song. Dum, dum, dum. And he recorded it like an Austin Powers 1960s thing. I was, first of all, I was shocked. And second of all, I'll admit I didn't care for it as much as my version. And it went to number one on the jazz charts. And who the hell am I to say anything? Once the songwriter is done with the song, once you put it into the world, just be grateful someone wants to record your song. It's never going to be the way you think it's going to be because now you've given it to another artist. So, so in answer to your question, Scott, in all seriousness, the songwriters actually have very little input unless the songwriter also happens to be the producer on the project where the song is getting recut. OK, then you it's really up to the producer and the artist to decide, not the songwriter. Sure, sure. That, that's a that, that that makes some sense. Yeah. Other questions before we talk a little bit more about songwriters and audio? That's that that's what we have for now. Let's 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 talk about about some audio. 
Great. I love, love a good audio conversation, right, Laura? I, I would think. Yeah, so, <laughs> it's my favorite kind. Ultimately, the, the question is, why should songwriters care about audio in the first place? Since, since in the end, all you're supposed to be doing is writing the song, right? Well, whether you're going to be a recording engineer or not, understanding the studio process can help you communicate your needs when it comes to the recording of your songs for your demos, for those masters that you're hoping to pitch to film and TV. The more that you understand, the more that you understand how to talk about condenser mics, the more you understand how to talk about what you're going for in the studio, first of all, the greater the likelihood that the people in the studio will trust what you are saying. And second of all, the greater the likelihood that you will be heard. So understanding the process, even if you're not an expert, is hugely valuable. Also, the better able you are to show the singers and the players in a professional studio what your song sounds like, starting with that rough recording that you make, the more likely you are to get what you want. This is, this is a huge thing. You know, as a, as a producer of songwriter demos, I worry all the time about translating my client's vision to my session musicians and singers. And I've worked with Laura in this regard. Laura is an amazing singer, and I have used her in my studio to do exactly that, to translate the client's vision into a beautiful sounding vocal. The better the client does at communicating that, and I'm sure Laura will agree, the easier it is for you as the singer to know what they want. It's just the way it works. So, Absolutely. So the more you understand as a songwriter about being able to achieve that, the greater the likelihood that you will get what you want. And then, ultimately, if your goal is not just to be a songwriter, but a singer-songwriter, a performer, you will dramatically increase the likelihood that one of those recordings that you record will be good enough to pitch as is to the music industry decision makers when the time comes. So you never know where that great magical take is going to come from. Why not give yourself every opportunity to capture the good one by setting up a good mic when you do it, especially if setting up a good mic is as simple as plugging something into your smartphone or your tablet or your laptop. So. I hope that you understand from, from what we've talked about today that, that rough recordings are a critical part of the songwriting and the studio process. Um, knowing what to do with those recordings is what separates amateurs from pros, very simply. And, and caring about all facets of the songwriting and the recording process not only helps you present your songs in the best light, but marks you as the kind of person that people will take seriously when it comes time to interface with the larger industry. So all that to say, don't let the, the name rough recording fool you. This is a critical part of the process and should be taken as seriously as every other part of the process. And one of my favorite quotes of all time is the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So by treating your rough recordings with respect, you're, building, you're starting with a great foundation that you can build on from there. That's what I got. That is a good phrase to live by. Wow. I like that. <laughs> That's cool. That, that, is, that is very good. Um, one of the things I kind of wanted to circle back to a little bit here, and this is maybe more Laura driven, um, talking a little bit more techie, specky kind of stuff. You know, we, we mentioned, and, and not we, I, I'm not gonna take away or take any credit for this. I haven't mentioned anything. Uh, you you mentioned and you referred to a bunch of different products that, you know, Shure has in its lineup for things such as studio recordings and, and rough recordings. When someone's looking, because I know one of the main, uh, as, as a consumer myself, when I'm looking for to buy something, I'm always looking at price point. That's always, and I think a lot of people get driven by price point and then, my mind goes to feature aspects and things of like course. that, which is definitely definitely the wrong way to be doing it in my mind. I, I should probably flip that around. But it's life, you know? But it's, it's true, life. yeah. You know, you definitely, obviously you have to stick in with your parameters of, of you know, what, what you can afford in terms of your budget and things like that. Right. You know, but I want to eliminate price for a second because let's imagine that, you know, I'm, I'm you know, a millionaire here. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll be humble. Sweet. I don't want to be a billionaire, just a millionaire. Okay. But, you know, in, in, in the line of products that you discussed, you know, how does somebody really differentiate and pick what's going to be best for them in terms of, you know, specifications and features? 
That's a great question. And I always recommend that people start with how they're going to be using the mic and where they're going to be using the mic. If you know that you're going to be going from writing session to writing session, like Cliff in Nashville, which is kind of status quo, then maybe you go for something like the MV88 Plus, which is highly portable, works with your phone, and gives you high quality sound. If you know you're going to be in a, in a spot, like a studio all the time, then you can use something that's a little bit more controlled, you know, then you make an investment into maybe a studio condenser mic like the KSM32, which is what I brought in a little while ago. But, you know, it, it's always, it comes down to how you're going to use it and what type of room you'll be using it in. Because when we talked about dynamic and condenser, if it's not a perfect sounding environment, maybe go with something like the MV7 that's going to give you more freedom and flexibility to not hear the leaf blower that's going on outside of my window right this very second. And, uh, you know, still get that great sounding <laughs> rough recording. Or, you know, it, it really just depends on application. Yeah, and, and, and I can totally commiserate with you because living in, inside of New York City, we've, we've been blessed and we're lucky enough that you don't hear all the buses honking and all the traffic that, that we usually get. Going I know, it's there. rush so hour right now. That's impressive. It, it, it is, and usually there's a lot of yelling and screaming going on outside of my window as well, oh. so I, I can definitely relate to the lawnmower. Well, I live in the <laughs> suburbs of Connecticut, so like I really have no excuse. It's just really bad timing. But I mean, that is why microphones like this one are created is to let you have that podcast, you know, wherever you are. And I can actually change it using this app to be in near mode and get even closer and block out even more of the sound coming in from extraneous sources. Uh, you know, so it, it just depends on how you're going to be using it. But all of our mics are, are pretty reasonable as well. That's why I love them, you know, so they you can get into something like the MVL for $69, um, and the MV7 is 249 so still not crazy, crazy expensive considering you're getting a USB XLR hybrid microphone that's going to do a lot of stuff. Awesome, awesome. So uh, just want to circle back to the conversation we had in the beginning. So like we spoke about, uh, we are doing a little bit of a giveaway. We've had that going on in the background, and we picked out a winner. Uh, this is for, like uh, Laura is showing us over there, for the MV88 video kit. Uh, so today, the lucky winner of that MV88 is going to be Doug Hupp. So Doug, congratulations to you. Uh, we want to make sure that we can get this to you. So if you can do us a favor and using the Q&A chat feature, if you just send us a message with your email address, uh, that would be great. Uh, nobody will see that besides us. So Feel free to share that with us. Otherwise, if you don't share with us, then we can't get your information and we can't send that to you. And I'm, I'm sure you definitely don't want to miss out on that, Doug. So make sure to get that in. Um, we'll be standing by waiting for that. Um, while we wait for Doug to send us his email address, uh, I want to kind of kick it back to Cliff real quick and give him an opportunity to kind of selflessly plug himself. Or, or selfishly plug myself, whichever. Whichever, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a songwriter and a music producer. I run a studio in Nashville. And one of the things that this particular studio does that, that I've developed over a number of years now is that we stream in real time the studio sessions. So if you're a songwriter that's written a country song, but you live in, I'm going to pick somewhere out of random, Guilford, Connecticut, for example, and you want Nashville's great musicians and singers to perform on your demo, but you want to listen while it's happening. That's what we do. So if you go to cliffgoldmacher.com, G-O-L-D-M-A-C-H-E-R.com, there's a studio section. You can find out more. Um, I also do song consultations for those of you who are wondering if you've done what you need to be doing on your songs. Long story short, I'm out there. I'm the only Cliff Goldmacher around. So come find me. And thank you, Scott. No, oh, thank you, thank you. And and are you are you on the uh, the, the Instagrams, the Facebook, any everything? All of those things at Cliff Goldmacher for Twitter and Instagram, and I think probably Facebook too. Everything. And then I mean, this seems like a silly question, but Laura, how can people find Shore? <laughs> they can go to shore.com and follow us on the socials as well. Please, please, please. If you tag us, we see you, and and you know, if we love the post, we'll share it. So you know. Doug, when you get your MV88+, plus, please tag, sure, and, and we want to share the love. 
Yeah, and tag BNH Photo as well. The BNH Photo event space. We'd love to know that you know you, you got it sent out. Um, I want to thank you, Cliff, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. You definitely gave me a lot of a lot of knowledge and insight uh, to singing, songwriting, uh, and and what to do with all of that stuff that I was telling you I was going to throw in the garbage. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully you prevented a major disaster on yes. my end. So I appreciate that. Uh, Laura and Shore, the team over there, thank you very much uh, for sponsoring the event and setting this up with Cliff. We really appreciate that as well. Uh, to everybody at home joining us today, uh, that's all we've got for the day. I know it seems like you know the day just started, but it is almost 6 p.m. So <laughs> it's 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 time to get out of here and you know maybe maybe take like you can see in in Cliff's background, take a nap. Uh, <laughs> so thanks again, guys, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks to Shore. Thanks to everybody joining us in. And uh, we'll catch you on another rendition of the BH event space shortly. And thank you, BH, and thank you, Shore. It's yes. always a pleasure to do this with you guys. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Have a good night, everybody.